I am reading The Planned Deception by Constance Cumby. This is Chapter 2, Early New Age Centers. Quote, The New Age movement got its start in 1978 and took its name from the name of a magazine. Unquote. Dr. Walter Martin, Bible Answer Man Program, Fall 1983. Despite Dr. Martin's ill-advised statement, the New Age movement certainly did not begin yesterday. Those involved by their own admissions have been so for many years. In The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, I gave a short history of the New Age movement. I lightly touched upon the activities of two pivotal New Age organizations, the Theosophical Society and Lucius Trust. Both are heavily Luciferian in origin and much, if not most of the modern New Age movement, can easily be traced to the influence of one or both of these organizations. However, there are other early projects which continue to ex exude influence in both the movement and the world for that matter. Some of them are directly traceable to theosophical antecedents. Most have had a direct and substantial influence upon academia. Unfortunately, many have impacted the Christian world as well. The World Council New Age inner organization did not start with Alice Bailey or even with Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Such activities were well in progress at the time of the American Revolution. One American general, Ethan Allen Hitchcock, was deeply involved in Rosicrucian activity. He also worked to build bridges with other occult organizations a supreme initiate. He was a member. Whoops. He was a member of the Council of Three for America. The Council of Three of the French Order of Eliphas Levi. Pause. Eliphas Levi, the guy who drew the Baphomet. Okay. The Council of Three of the French Order of Eliphas Levi and a co-worker and co-member with Albert Pike of the Scottish Rite. Three more early networkers were Gutman, Weigel, and Studian. These were known to other initiates as the Three, Hermetic, quote-unquote, Christian initiates. They were also members of the World Council. As do modern-day New Agers, these men also refer to their efforts as the Great Work. Swinburne Clymer discusses their networking in frank detail. While von Suchen was engaged in the Great Work in Switzerland and Holland, Nicholas Bernard, the French alchemist, hermetic initiate, and member of the World Council, was active in France. Bernard was of an entirely different type from that of the philosophic initiates and in that he was frankly and openly engaged in trying to harmonize their desires for a world confederation. For this purpose he traveled extensively and met many if not almost all of the initiates and even the acolytes engaged in the great work. Because of his activity in this direction he became known among the brethren as the door, and through his efforts, many entered the portals, <laughs> the portals of the confederation then forming. Organized Christian Infiltration At the same time, the occult initiates were working on penetrating and subverting the Christian churches. Quote, in Germany, Simon Studian, mystic, alchemist, Lutheran, convert, Periclesian enthusiast, and member of the World Council, was occupied in establishing the Militia Crucifera Evangelica, a Christian occult society for the purpose of attracting all those who no longer believed in the infallibility of the Catholic Church and who were engaged in the study of of mystic and occult literature." Unquote. Then as now, cooperation between the different occult schools was said to be necessary to accomplish the religious subversion. 
Meanwhile, Julius Berber had attained full philosophic initiation and became a co-worker with Studian in the establishment of the Militia Crucifera Evangelica. But visioning the future of the great work engaged in the preparation of a text, Sperber was a Christian initiate with a vision sufficiently clear to comprehend that if the about-to-be-born confederation, the Fraternitas, the Fraternitas, I'm sorry, was to be a success and fulfill its mission, all initiates of every school would need to work in harmony with one another. The Aranos Lectures and the Bullington Foundation The Bullington Foundation grew out of the 1930s work of Alice Bailey and Olga Froby Kapdian. Olga played a critical role in what academicians call the occult revival. This revival gained its original moment momentum from the work of Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Olga was deeply impressed by occult-oriented academics, and she decided to start a cultural center for them at her picturesque Lake Megori, Switzerland estate at Escana. There she would gather the most brilliant minds of esotericism. She believed it would be a natural setting for exchange of occult ideas between like-minded academics. It was hardly a new setting for such activity. Escana, Switzerland had long been a center of offbeat activity where even Lenin and Trotsky sought inspiration. Quote, it had been an outpost of advanced thought and morality since the late 19th century. Free thinkers, nudists, and vegetarians have their communes on the slopes of Mont Verita. Artists, writers, dancers, political radicals, utopians, gurus found their way to Ascana. The list included Lenin, Trotsky, Bakunin, Krop <coughs> Kropotkin, Hess, Stephen George, Rudolf Steiner, Mary Wigman, Isadora Duncan, Hans Arp, Paul Klee, Emil Jennings, Emil Ludwig, and Eric Maria Remark. Unquote. In 1930, Olga went to the United States and sought out Alice Bailey. They jointly organized the School of Spiritual Research. Its first summer school session was held in 1930. In 1931, Alice and Foster Bailey went to Switzerland to help with the sessions. The Bailey family, three children included, journeyed there by ship. They stayed at the scenic Lake Majori location until 1933. Wow, that's a couple of years. Some of the guests, however, gave even Alice Bailey cold shutters. Quote, the place was overrun by German professors and the whole tone and quality of the place altered. Some of them were most undesirable, and the teaching given shifted from a relatively high spiritual plane to that of academic philosophy and spurious esotericism, unquote. It is possible that Foster had a deeper understanding of the plan than even his wife. Alice Bailey's personal writings do not sound particularly bigoted or anti-Semitic, but when she allows the Tibetan master DK to write through her, she does. It is probable that in this instance, Alice was truthful. She was probably genuinely repulsed by the German quality she found there during those crucial pre-war years. Husband Foster appeared to be a little less naive. Quote, Another approved hierarchical project is the uniting of the nations of Europe in one cooperating peaceful community. One attempt was begun was to begin by uniting the peoples living in the Rhine River Valley using that river as a binding factor. It was an attempt by a disciple but did not work. Sometimes their plans don't work. Just remember that. Unpause. Now another attempt is in full swing, namely the six-nation European common market. Unquote. So that was Foster Bailey, talking about Hitler, basically. 
Even though uneasy over some of the clientele, Alice Bailey noted the importance of their Ascana work to the plan. The work done in Ascana for three years had brought a number of people of different nationalities into the school, referring to Lucius Trust's Arcane School, and those along with others who had already joined the school through reading the books had produced a nucleus in many countries in Europe on which we could build the future work. Unquote. Pause. So this New Age movement did not start in 1978. Sorry, anyway. Alice perceptively noted the academic philosophy orientation at these Aranos conferences. As distasteful as it was to her, it probably was decreed by the masters to speed the progress of the plan by making it academically respectable. Among the many occult topics intellectualized and made respectable at the Aranos lectures were the Great Mother, I Ching, Yoga, and number symbolism. Wow. As James Webb observed, the Aranos conferences are a compendium of all the elements of the occult revival. Both Alice Ann Bailey and Olga Froby Captain showed missionary-like zeal to their cause. Alice Bailey gave freely of her time. Olga Captain sacrificed nearly all of her money. Given their ironclad dedication, it is not surprising that significant breakthroughs should have occurred. And the breakthroughs did come, for it was at Ascona that the primary task of making occultism respectable, I'm sorry, respectable through translating it from back room hocus pocus to academic scholarship occurred. More significant still was the fact that this happened simultaneously with occult penetration of political thought in the rise of Hitler. Once professional academia became fertile ground for occultism, other fields such as mental health and education easily followed. Maria Montessori had views of superchildren very similar to those of Hitler's supermen. Carl Jung attained extreme providence in both mental health and religion. Mercia Eliade, a former ashram resident, went on to dominate comparative religion scholarship. All these and many more were important precursors for shaping the forthcoming leadership of the New Age. Just as Olga Kaptian's personal estate was dwindling, she received generous financial support, which enabled her to continue. Paul and Mary Mellon... Pittsburgh millionaires. Pause. I'm from Pittsburgh, so, you know, it's like great. Okay. Paul and Mary Mellon, Pittsburgh millionaires, were her financial angels. As a near worshiper of Carl Jung, Mary Mellon wished to help Olga because that was where his work was centered. Jung was himself a first rate occult initiate. He was influenced by sources ranging from Swedenborg to spirit guides. Olga Kaptian's first occult contacts were the Theosophical Society. She later added to this Carl Jung's psychology and archetypal theory. Others coming there eventually Kumaswami, Kumaraswami, Mercia Eliad, D. T. Suzuki, Joseph Campbell, John Barrett, Joland Jacoby, Louis Massing Young, and T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot. Okay, pause, guys. Um, you remember the, the show Cats, the Broadway show? That's T.S. Eliot. Because he wrote a book of poems about cats. And they used all his poems for mostly all the lyrics. Just a fun fact. Unpause. Mercia Eliot proudly occupied Alice Bailey's former bedroom at the Uranus lecture site. Also, I'm sorry about my pronunciation of some of these names. Sadly, Mercia Eliad appears to be respected. His occult biases are seldom called, called question, even among evangelicals. I was startled when Brooke Alexander, Spiritual Counterfeits Project Director, quoted his Bullington book to distinguish between authentic 
and inauthentic shamanism. Yet how many of those, so quoting, including Brooke Alexander himself, an authority on cults, really know who he is and what Bollingen was? During World War II, the United States government pressured the Mellons to discontinue their support of Bollingen and the Aranos lectures. The government maintained that such support violated the Trading with the Enemy Act, while William McGuire maintains the innocence of both Carl Jung and Olga Froby Captain of such attitudes. There, other scholars, such as James Webb, believe with some justification that there were Nazi influences upon that center. At any rate, it is difficult to see how those knowledgeable in the occult could not immediately see that they and Hitler had the same beliefs. At any rate, the 40s and 1950s saw public debate rage over the Bollingen, Bollingen Foundation and its alleged Nazi ties. Ironically, Norman Cousins and his Saturday Review asked Congress to investigate it. Has the movement changed? Or has Norman Cousins, like so many others, succumbed to the mysticism which has turned so many into full-blown initiates? <clears throat> it was long rumored that Carl Jung had solid Nazi connections. Pause. Carl Jung, he's like one of the fathers of modern psychology. Just, I know a lot of you know that, but not everybody knows that. You know, just saying. Uh, McGuire's History of Bollingen is itself a publication of the foundation. Therefore, it, it would be expected that general innocence would be maintained, and it is. But even at that, interesting clues are given. Quote, Young's unavoidable contacts with the bureaucracy in Berlin exposed him to the charge of pro-Nazi sympathies. The matter has continued to be controversial. In the same summer, Young was interviewed on Radio Berlin by a German neurologist partial to the regime. Young's responses to leading questions give an impression of tolerance, if not approval, of events in Germany, or they might be adjudged somewhere between tactful and ambiguous." Unquote. Whether there was overt Nazi networking between Carl Jung, Olga Froby Captain, and the Bollingen Foundation or not, it is a fact that they all came from a common well. Nazism, as well as Jonestown, dramatically illustrate the final solution offered by occultism. And here's the chapter notes. And, of course, if you would like to um, read these yourself, there is a link in the description. And you can find it on the internet as well. Chap ne the next chapter is Chapter 3, Conscious Political Networking, Then and Now. This should be interesting. The beat goes on. The beat goes That can keep you out of hell, and it's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus.